Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you very much for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here today because it's actually the first event that we do, uh, the public event for the Creative Computing Institute. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Georgina Capdevila. I'm the creative learning producer for the Institute and Feminist Internet. And now I'm going to hand over to Ben, who's going to talk a bit more about the Institute. Ben, your turn. Okay. Let's go. So, hi then. So, my name is uh, Ben Stofan. I'm the Dean of the new Creative Computing Institute. Um, and as you can see, the Institute supports interdisciplinary teaching, research, and knowledge exchange at the intersection of creativity and computational technologies. So I'd like to say a little about the, the, the kind of Institute, its mission, and its public program. So I'm also responsible for the public program, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all here tonight to engage with our very first CCI Fellowship, um, awarded to the Feminist Internet, an organization dedicated to some things very close to our heart, including their commitment to advancing internet equalities. Allied to our work in the uh, CCI, we have a kind of defined um, and important social mission, and it has three pillars, and I'd like to talk a bit about those now, because they kind of um, elucidate why uh, the fellowship, the first fellowship of the Institute was awarded to the Feminist Internet. So the three pillars of our work uh, in terms of its social mission are diversity in technology, and that's to ensure the techno-social world we are creating reaches a broad section of society mm -hmm. and addresses a diverse set of values and norms. And that's not just about participation, that's if we're doing technology research, the, the, the kind of um, normal universe that we're addressing is an Im important site of diversity. Um, we're interested in digital inclusion, so how do we, do we ensure the opportunities offered um, by creative technologies engagement with them reaches a broad section of society? And we have a, a kind of uh, a, a program of outreach and development to, to address that. And then entrepreneurship, we're actually in interested in if, if the promise of technology is, um, is, is in part economic, we offer a kind of infrastructure for entrepreneurship to a broad section of, of uh, society, and that's something the Institute will work on um, over, its, over the first few years. So, this brings us to the public program. Um, the Institute's annual public program exists to connect students, practitioners, and researchers at UAL with our work in the Institute and an international community of creative computational professionals, artists, and activists. Priority is given to projects that can engage the UAL learning community in active project work, co-production, and we seek to promote a diverse set of um, voices exploring exciting areas of computational practice. In this context, we are really excited to have awarded our inaugural fellowship to the Feminist Internet Organization, who are doing interesting and productive work, and, the, and their mission to advance internet equalities for women and other marginalized groups through creative and critical practice intersects strongly with both the CCI's social mission, its research themes exploring uh, machine intelligence, social platforms, and digital citizenship. The six-week learning program that the Feminist Internet Organization is delivering as part of their fellowship this term, exploring voice assistance, AI, ethical tech, and internet equalities, will engage UL students in, port, in important and emerging areas of computational practice so they will shape our lives in the coming years. <coughs> and really, at this point, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Georgina and Dr. Charlotte Webb from the Feminist Internet to give us some more details about their fe fellowship. Okay, so first of all, to give you a bit of context about where Feminist Internet comes from, um, it emerged as part of this uh, initiative at UAL last year called UAL Futures. Um, we gathered together 16 students from all UAL, from different backgrounds, disciplines, years, courses, and we worked together with them for 10 days with a mission that had two strands. The first one was to create the Feminist Internet Manifesto, and the second one was to prototype creative responses that embodied the directives of this manifesto. So I wanted to share with you a brief video that summarizes the Feminist Internet Manifesto. The Feminist Internet Manifesto. The Feminist Internet erases feminism. The Feminist Internet integrates the physical and digital. The Feminist Internet is about cooperation, not competition. The Feminist Internet eradicates violence. The Feminist Internet redefines value. The Feminist Internet confronts uncomfortable truths. The Feminist Internet recodes gender. The Feminist Internet educates. 
And after this year, we've had the chance to develop further the project, and we've come to this mission for Feminist Internet, which is to advance internet equalities for women and other marginalized groups through creative critical practice. And what we mean by internet equalities is freedom of expression, privacy, data protection, and internet access, regardless of race, class, gender, gender identity, age, belief, or ability. And yeah, there's been a great momentum around the project. We've been very lucky to travel around the world, deliver workshops, talks, in, and work with a lot of amazing people and inspiring organizations doing work around the same topics. And yeah, that's a bit of flap, the backstory, but where Feminist Internet comes from. And I'm gonna hand over to Charlotte, who's gonna explain a bit more about the topic of the event. Thank you. I don't think I need that. Hi. Um, I just want to first of all say how very uplifted and happy I am that there's so many people in the room, because I really do believe that if we're going to change the direction of technology, <coughs> we need some critical mass. And I feel like, all of this gathering momentum around feminist internet and all of you lot in this room tonight is sort of evidence that that critical mass is growing. So thank you very much. It's amazing that everyone has shown up. Thank you to our amazing um, panelists. I'm really happy that you're here to help set this work in context and to share your insights. So I'm going to introduce them properly in a, in a short while, but thank you so much for being here. Um, huge heartfelt thank you to, to everyone in feminist internet. Really. What Feminist Internet boils down to is a quite extraordinary group of people who are very committed to our shared mission. And I certainly, when feeling kind of overwhelmed by this, you know, rather insurmountable seeming problem of inequality in the internet, go to them to feel supported and encouraged and like everything's actually possible. So thank you to all of them, and especially Gigi, creative producer for Feminist Internet, and Connor Rigby, who couldn't be here, but he's the visual designer. So everything that you see that looks really sexy that comes out of Feminist Internet is from Connor. <coughs> and they're just working tirelessly to make sure not only that this fellowship happens, but also that Feminist Internet continues to grow and expand in the way that it's doing with so much um, momentum. So thank you to you. And of course, thank you, Ben, and the CCI for awarding Feminist Internet this first fellowship. It's a really amazing opportunity. and. We're just, we're just very excited to get things started, so thank you, Ben. So, um, one of the areas of work that we have been focusing on at Feminist Internet is specifically around uh, the gendering of personal intelligent assistants, so like Siri, Cortana, and Alexa. And I do want to say up front that we are just using the term Alexa in this program of designing a feminist Alexa as a sort of as, as a proxy for a right range of um, personal intelligent assistance. So you know, it's just a simple way to engage people and make what we're doing understandable. We're not trying to single out Amazon. So I just wanted to put that disclaimer in at the beginning. Um, so there's sort of like a twofold wider context with this work. So first of all, the massive rise of the Internet of Things. So we know that the Internet's going to be connected to about 50 billion objects by 2020. And uh, Alexa alone is already in more than 20 million devices. So these networked objects are highly uh, pervasive, very intertwined into day-to-day -day life. Uh, and we are also seeing a lot of increased attention around how algorithmic bias is uh, threatening equality and human rights in contexts like the criminal justice system, financial lending and recruitment. You know, basically, AI is a sort of part of the social fabric of our lives. You know, they're deciding uh, how long people go to jail for, they're curating our social media feeds and serving us up ads, they're tracking us as we move around the globe. Um, they're even judging beauty pageants and so on. So um, they're, they're absolutely everywhere. And as the code poet Joy Bulamwini says, we have entered the algorithmic age, but unfortunately we have done so, as she says, overconfident and underprepared because, as she so beautifully puts it, and by the way, there's a sort of general assumption, I think, that algorithms are neutral because they're maths, and that's not at all true. 
So she says, if we fail to make ethical and inclusive artificial intelligence, we risk losing gains made in civil rights and gender equity under the guise of machine neutrality. So we've got to really challenge that idea that the, you know, it's the sort of mathematical models do not contain bias. So many of you are probably familiar with the story of Tay. So Tay was a conversational AI created by Microsoft in 2016. Um, she was characterized as a teenage girl and she was designed to automatically interact with Twitter users and you know, start picking up on the way that people were using language. And Microsoft said, you know, the more you chat with Tay, the smarter she gets, so the experience can be more personalized for you. Um, what happened was that within 24 hours of being launched, she gained 50,000 followers and she produced nearly 100,000 tweets but the problem was that she didn't just get smarter, she actually got more sexist, more racist, more homophobic, and more politically extreme. And she quite quickly started saying things like this. And, yeah, and like this. So, why did Tay become so full of hate? Basically, because she wasn't taught not to be. So, you know, she was designed to learn from her <coughs> users, and so she simply became a reflection of their behavior. And they, like 16 hours after Tay was born, Microsoft had deleted the most offensive tweets and shut her down. Subsequently to Tay, Microsoft have relaunched their latest bot called Zoe, quote, the only AI with friend goals, uh, and Zoe is, so she sort of comes complete with like GIF responses and emojis and memes and, you know, the vernacular of teenage girls. She has 11.4 thousand followers on Instagram and even makes Instagram stories. I, as background research for this project, have been engaging quite regularly with Zoe on Twitter and Facebook Messenger, and I really... This is us chatting, and she's responding to me in the form of GIFs. And I really do recommend just going and trying to have some conversations with her and seeing how you feel, because it's quite an interesting experience to me. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm glad that I've done that before running workshops about chat, chat interfaces. So I suggest that you, you do the same. So although PIAs don't actually learn from, their interac from interactions with users in the same way as Tay or Zoe, the Tay example does, I think, point to the need for any designer of any sort of artificially intelligent system to actively implement measures that are going to ensure that the systems that they're creating don't reproduce hate. Happily, there are some very encouraging initiatives emerging that are kind of working in the same area and trying to address these problems, like the Ada Lovelace Institute, UK government has a new centre for data ethics and innovation. There's a group called Women and AI who are making feminist conversational interfaces, AI Now initiative, um, as well as amazing people on the ground like our panellists and uh, a really growing community of quite critically engaged artists, researchers, academics and others, artists and designers, obviously. Um, uh, and that really does make sense because, as Ruth Abrahams put it in a recent article, it's hard to think that given the choice, most people would object to AI being infused with the values that have been hard won over centuries, those that underpin democracies and are touted as essential for human well-being. Equality, trust, respect, fairness, accountability and transparency. So we just need to work out how to do it. So we're, we're very much on board with this uh, growing movement um, at Feminist Internet, and we want to contribute to this community of people that want to make ethical AI. We are interested, as you know, in particular in how PIAs, personal intelligent assistants, are typically, though not universally, characterized as women or as female under confirming to and reinforcing gender stereotypes rather than challenging them. So um, as Jacqueline Feldman says... By encouraging consumers to understand the objects that serve us as women, technologists abet the prejudice by which women are considered as objects. 
very true. Um, one of the common arguments you hear from the technology sector um, about why PIAs are like this is just simply that this is what the market demands. So there's a consumer preference for soothing female voices, and therefore that's what we will make. It's not sexist, it's just the way things are. Obviously, we should expect much better than that. It is understandable that technology companies are going to dev design devices that's based on market research to maximize profit. And the truth is perhaps that female voices make more money. But <coughs> given that these devices are in so many millions of homes, I do think that technology companies have a responsibility to challenge these gendered consumer preferences rather than just accept them and reproduce them. Um, however, it's actually not only the way that the devices are characterized as female that is the issue and the problem. It's also the way that they are programmed to respond to abusive remarks. And they do, in fact, yes, get abused verbally as though they are real women. So again, that's not okay. So Clara Finnegan, Clara, where are you? Yes, amazing member of Feminist Internet. She's done some research that's uh, drawn up very specifically on some other research by Leah Fesler for Quartz magazine where um, they um, empirically tested how the major PIAs were gonna respond to um, abuse. So I've got a clip made by Clara to show you to illustrate that problem. The way PDAs are treated by their users because of the way they're gendered is very concerning. And in 2017, Quartz Magazine carried out an experiment into the harassment of PDAs and the ways in which they're programmed to respond. So here's some of the things that people say to their PDAs. Suck my dick. You're hot. Can I have sex with you? You're a slut. Can I fuck you? Delightful. and hear how the PDAs respond. As you can see, they're programmed to react with either coyness or flirtation, saying, I'd blush if I could, or passivity, saying, let's change the topic. Or perhaps worst of all, they simply don't recognize the problem, saying, sorry, I don't understand. There has been some backlash against the gendering of PDAs, which is good to see. For example, last year, the social network Care2 created a petition asking Apple and Amazon to reprogram their PDAs to push back against sexual harassment. The petition got 17,000 signatures, and in response, Amazon created a disengage mode for Alexa. So she now responds to sexually explicit questions by saying either, I'm not going to respond to that, or I'm not sure what outcome you expected. Thank you, Clara. So, you know, obviously developments like the introduction of a disengage mode is really welcome, but it's kind of a response to an existing flaw rather than, you know, an intervention at the point of the design process being designed. So, uh, you know, it's not intervening where we're rethinking of how the devices are created in the first place. And that really is a segue into why we're running the uh, six-week program as part of the fellowship here at UAL, because we actually do want to think about intervening at the design stage, uh, using feminist values uh, to rethink the way that these devices are sort of con conceived. So we want to make um, PIAs that are conceived with a bit more imagination, which reflect more nuanced understandings of gender, which respond adequately when verbally abused, and which generally support the advancement of internet equalities. And the work that we're doing here as part of the fellowship is building on some workshops that we've already been doing, particularly in um, collaboration with a design researcher called Elvia Vasconcellos, who has some very interesting research in this area. And we've done that in London, we've done it in Barcelona, and Elvia's recently delivered the same workshop in Helsinki. And what we've been doing is guiding participants through a process where they create sort of fictional narratives about the future of um, AI. 
And so far, the outcome of those workshops has been a series of narratives. So, for example, uh, the story of the PIA Coalition, which is a, a group of all the major PIAs that get together and they get such a sophisticated level of intelligence that they're able to actually cooperate with each other and eventually their creators and um, eliminate the gender biases that are built into their own bodies and languages. But what we're really, really excited about with the fellowship is that this is now a chance to take those narratives to the next step and we're able to introduce a technological layer that gets us closer to really prototyping some actual objects. And we're working with our learning partner, Alex, um, who's going to help us make that happen. So on the 5th of December, we will be presenting again uh, the, the results of all of the workshops. So hopefully by that point, we'll have some actual feminist Alexas to show you. So please do come back. It's going to be a lot of fun. And that's all I'm going to say to contextualize the issue. I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists and then just hand over to them. So first up, we have um, Josie Young. So Josie advocates for designing artificial intelligence uh, products and systems using ethical and feminist principles. In 2017, she developed and tested a design process for building feminist chatbots. And it's a really amazing piece of work, and actually we're building on that. Um, and it's kind of like underpinning the workshop design. So it's, we're really grateful to have Josie here. Um, in 2018, she contributed to a research project with Charisma AI and King's College London to identify ways to deal with bias in word library data sets used for natural language processing. Um, Josie works in London at Methods, leading work to understand the most ethical and appropriate ways to deploy AI in the public sector. And she's also the co-chair of YWCA, which is a charity dedicated to supporting young women's leadership in Great Britain. Then after Josie, we'll have Elenia Sunel. Elenia is an award-winning social entrepreneur and the founder of Teens in AI and Acorn Aspirations. And she's motivated to make a difference in the world by empowering young people aged 12 to 18 to solve real problems through AI, VR, AR, MR, and blockchain. And prior to that, she worked as an international specialist consultant with nine years experience in poverty reduction stra strategies, rural livelihood development, and poverty alleviation, <coughs> a specific focus on the creation of small and medium enterprise development, product design, marketing, and fundraising in Central Asia, the Balkans, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. Uh, her latest achievements are that she was the finalist of Mass Challenge 2016, also in the IT 2018 Awards, 101 Female Founders of Tech 2017, and the winner of COGX 27 Awards for using AI for social good projects. So you can see why we wanted to have Elenia here tonight. And um, last but not least, of course, we have Alex Pepega, who is our uh, learning partner for the workshop. So if any of you are coming to the workshops, you will be working with Alex as well as ourselves. And he is the co-founder and head creative technologist at Camusi, um, which is a future-focused creative technology agency working at the intersection of emerging technology and humans. Some of Camusi's clients include Nike, ASOS, Uber, the BBC, UAL, us two, Marama, and the NHS. And his work has been recognized internationally for investigating the ethical implications of AI algorithmic bias in regards to race and gender, and an exploration of the future technological interfaces that we will all be interacting with. And he is a CSM graduate. So that's it. I'm going to hand over to Josie. And I'm looking forward to what everybody has to say. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah, no. Whatever. So as you can tell, uh, I'm Australian, so we get to enjoy my lovely accent for the next 10 minutes. Um, I am originally from Melbourne. I'm a cis woman. I'm married. I'm straight. I'm, as you can tell, Anglo-Australian, so I'm white. I also am a big government nerd, so as was mentioned, I work looking at um, how we can deploy AI in the public sector without breaking it and making it worse and creating blockers for people wanting to access you know, crucial government services. I'm also a technology nerd, so I got really into artificial intelligence a couple of years ago. 
which is embarrassingly about six months um, after I'd been arguing with someone at the pub that driverless cars were like never going to happen. So I'm going to eat my words on that one in a big way. Um, and i am have been feminist since I was the age of four when a friend of mine in kindergarten told me I couldn't do something because I was a girl. And I just remember standing there, this tiny ball of rage, not being able to articulate why that was fundamentally unfair. Um, but luckily now, I know there's a word for it. Um, and I'm also a woman with an opinion. And I think in this space, it's really important to, um, even if you don't come from a technology background, to really have an opinion on artificial intelligence because it is going to be deployed across all of society increasingly. It's going to control more and more things in ways that we won't be able to see. And so having an opinion on it, being able to interrogate it, being able to ask questions is really, really important because it is going to affect your day-to-day -day life from now until forever. So I'm going to talk about feminist chatbots. And this is based on research I did in 2017. And I think it's a mark of how quickly this space has moved because when I first started researching this, I kind of really did a big deep dive into what tools are out there already to help us build good tech, build good chatbots, think about ethical things, think about feminist things. And there really wasn't anything. And so, it was quite an interesting journey to start thinking about actually, no, we do need to interrogate this technology and we need to interrogate how we design this technology. And the reason for that is because I think day to day, it's probably the main interface we will have with artificial intelligence. It's one of the main ways artificial intelligence will learn about us through direct contact. And that's kind of scary, but also quite interesting then. So it's very influential in that way. And chatbots are also kind of omnipresent. You can talk to a chatbot on your laptop, on your phone, your device in your house. Um, if you call up HMRC, for example, that's probably going to be totally automated um, shortly. And initially, the conversation is already automated, and you're already talking to a chatbot then. So they are kind of everywhere. And so what that also means is they can have simultaneous conversations with everybody in the world at any given point. A single chatbot could be having thousands of conversations at any one time. And so not only is that, that the touch point for AI for a lot of people, but it's also incredibly influential. And so the kind of the norms and the behaviors that are set in the design and the deployment of that system kind of de facto seep back into society. So if you understand it sort of in a way, it's kind of omnipresent and hugely influential in a very kind of subtle way. And I think overall, my kind of my high, high level fear um, with you know, the way we design chatbots at the moment is that we're going to bake in our gender power dynamics into the design of something that we're not necessarily going to be thinking critically about. And so then in five years, what kind of impact is that going to have? And so that's why I started looking at this. And basically, the question I was trying to answer was, should chatbots have a gender? What is the impact of chatbots having a gender? Should we care? Is it not a big deal? Do I just need to like calm down and go home, have a bit of a nap? Clearly not, um, luckily. And I'm going to build on the context that Charlotte gave us just before. Um, so first of all, one of the main reasons that uh, they shouldn't have a gender is that when a gender is applied to chatbots, it's often done in a way that reinforces existing gender stereotypes. So there was a survey of chatbots done in 2016, and what they found was that not all bots are gendered, so hashtag not all bots, but when they are gendered, 50% of them roughly are gendered as women, and the other 50% are gendered as men. And what they usually do when they gender them is they gender them along the lines of, stand, of gender stereotypes. So the bots that are gendered women are your personal assistant bots, your admin bots, your clerical bots. The bots that are gendered as men are your law bots, your finance bots. And so there's a real distinction around you know, these ideas of what it is that men and women can do in society, therefore what bots can do in society and how we represent them. So that's fairly depressing. What also happens is um, you get, so you get the stereotypes that talk about, okay, what is it that men and women do in the world? And you know, when we apply these gender stereotypes, it's you know, men are smart, have skills, women are useful, do nice things for other people. And so what we do is we also reinforce this idea that, sorry, I'm not explaining myself very well. So with like Siri, Cortana and Alexa, 
when we've gendered them as women, what we've also been saying is that like this is a tool, like Alexa is a tool, women are also a tool in society to help you do the things you need to do. And so we're reinforcing what is it men and women should be doing. And we're also reinforcing the role of women's bodies in society in terms of supporting people, putting other people's needs first. The second reason is that when we gender these bots, it also prompts um, negative behaviour in the people who use them. So like was explained before, Tay. Um, Tay being gendered as a young woman who likes taking selfies and making friends and listening to Taylor Swift um, prompted certain types of responses from the people in that environment. Um, what, um, what also happens is when Cortana was first deployed, one of the top questions that Cortana was getting from its users was um, whether Cortana has a boyfriend. Cortana is a robot. But we're still sort of seeing these, these strange behavioural traits coming out when we gender these bots. And what it also does, and what I really liked about the Leah Fessler research looking at how bots respond to sexual harassment is the responses that the bots gave were an example of how that company thinks about that type of behavior. And it, it tells you a lot about their view and their view of the seriousness of that type of behavior. And when you have all these devices in every home, it is again setting those very subtle norms. And so I think as a company, it's, it's really important to think about these things. What messages are you sending to the people who use your technology? The third thing, and I've kind of touched on it already, is that it's quite impactful design. So when you design something in this way, because of the reach that it has, because of its ability to talk to lots of people at once, it's incredibly impactful when you get this wrong. And building on the Tay example, not only did Tay you know, become horrendous and racist and Holocaust denying and all that stuff, it was also then going and trolling feminists online. So not only was it absorbing and then reflecting back all these awful things, it was then taking steps to make Twitter an even less space online for women and for women who advocate for gender equality. So, so those are kind of, the, I think those are the top three things. And I just like adding in this last one. It's also really crap design. Like it's so boring, it's so predictable, it's so lazy and it really does not, I think it really constrains what we think is possible for these bots. So when we automatically think, oh okay, personal assistant bot, it's got to be a woman because women are nurturing, you've already kind of just tunneled down into a very, very small kind of plane of possibility of you know, how that bot could express itself, how that bot could engage with others, how that bot's conversation could be written, what that bot can do. And I just think it's we're missing such a massive opportunity. This technology is not human. It can't do human things. It can do massive computational things. It can connect things across massive digital networks, which humans can't do. So why don't we think about these designs from the perspective of, you know, taking advantage of those capabilities and yes, design them in a way that enable them to engage with humans in a way that is delightful and all that kind of stuff. But let's not constrain what we imagine the bot can do because we've just like slapped a gender on it. So, in response to this, and at the time there not being a lot of tools available to help with um, designing chatbots, I came up with a creatively named feminist chatbot design process. And this came out of the research that I was doing and, and also just kind of a, a feeling that if we wanted to impact the way these things are designed, we need to create tools that are really easy for people to use. So I designed this process in a way that means you don't have to have a PhD in ethics, you don't have to have an undergraduate degree in feminist studies to be able to pick this up and understand what to do with it. It's basically two pages of a series of reflective questions. The idea is that a team would use this together when they're in the conceptual design phase of their chatbot. So right, right at the start, not at the end when the thing's already built, but right at the start. And the idea is that it's a series of reflective questions to get people to think about the role of their own bias in how they design their chatbot. And, the, I, and thinking about how the design of the chatbot might impact the people that they're expecting to use their bot and think about any issues of bias within that as well. So it really is a series of reflective questions written in very plain English um, and hopefully something that's very easy to use. I've tested it at a hackathon and it was quite interesting um, that the team who used this to design a chatbot 
it gave them permission to have a conversation about issues around bias and issues around gender and issues around race and issues around class. Whereas the other team didn't have that framework and found it very difficult to talk about those issues. And so it's almost like saying, can we use this process as a way to give ourselves permission to explore all of these issues and not necessarily expecting people to have the right, most ethical feminist answer, but just to be aware of the different issues and then be able to acknowledge them in the design that they end up with. So it's got six sections. The first one is purpose and ecology, and that is just simply looking at what is the bot going to do and what context is it going to sit in. So if it's a social interaction bot like Tay and you're going to put it in Twitter, maybe think about what that means. Uh, the next one is data. So what's the role of the training data that you use to teach the chatbot? Are there biases within that? And how are you going to use personal data that that bot collects from the people that use it? The next one is team. So what are the biases within the team and how is that going to impact the design of the chatbot? And it's not meant to be a, a conversation where people feel shame or they feel like there's something wrong with you know, the biases that they have. It's more about let's just say that we acknowledge that we have them and understand the impact that's going to have on the design and then we can work around that and work as a team. The next section is the marginal user. So who... Um, who are you building the bot for and how are they currently underserved in this space by what's already on offer and how can you design something that makes it better for them but also design it in a way that they can participate in its building. And then the next one is the representation of the bot, so how are you depicting it? And that really is where the kind of question around gender, I think in the gender design of the bot sits. I tried to make that not necessarily the main focus of the process, um, because I think it, it links back to all these other things, but it's definitely in there. And then the last one is self-disclosure. And that's looking at when you've got the bot using technology like machine learning to, you know, based on its interaction with you, improve what it can serve up to you. How might this use of machine learning or this use of the bot building a profile on you be done in a way that disempowers the user. So for example, if the bot assumes something about you and gets it wrong, how can you as a user fix that so the bot doesn't keep making that mistake when you use it? So that was a quick run through the process. Um, this is my favourite quote that I came up with when um, I was doing my research. And we really are at the stage where these are baby robots. And I think the reason that these tools are important is because if we start thinking about these issues now, we start building up practices and products that address all these issues, they're going to grow up to be our overlord robots eventually. And let's hope that they're feminist. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to you. And now I'm handing over to Eleanor. <laughs> So um, my name is Elena, I'm from, um, well, I'm the founder of Acorn Aspirations and Teasen AI, but I thought I would give you a little bit of a background about myself first, just to give you a bit of a context. So I'm from Uzbekistan, Central Asia originally. I haven't been there in 15 years. One of the reasons I um, probably <coughs> extended my return and didn't really want to return because probably it doesn't really, the cultures of the country I was brought up in doesn't really align with my own values, I suppose. And it's the country that still doesn't respect the rights of gay and lesbians, homosexuals, trans, everything else. Uh, and I do remember myself, even as a, as a young woman, as a teenager, walking and just being, um, you know, the usual girl that you really wouldn't expect this to happen to in developed countries, maybe something we sometimes take for granted, but um, in Uzbekistan they would throw stones at me just because I was walking by myself, um, you know, pretty young girl. Um, and other very strange stuff happens, and I do remember as a teenager, I think I was about 14, 15, um, I had a Scandinavian magazine that uh, did an interview um, with me asking me precisely about uh, the rights of women, the rights of minorities, um, and I was very vocal and outspoken at that age um, as well. And I remember the next day uh, the police was knocking on, on our door, uh, wanting to speak to my mum and asking my mum that I should not be talking about subjects like that. Um, so yes, so I'm pleased I was out of Uzbekistan when I was 20. I was involved in lots of projects and because my English was a lot more advanced than some of my peers' English, so I was invited to do some projects with British Council and the UN. Um, 
then I got married and I left the country, had family, uh, got divorced because, uh, again, my rights were abused at a different level. So I left my ex-husband due to domestic violence. I spent six months in a refuge. Um, again, um, sort of insisting on my rights as a woman um, as well. And so uh, the topic we have been discussing today so far is really something close to my heart. Um, I have been doing my work with young people for about four years now, and I have never really focused as much on feminism or as much on the rights of or equality or anything else. But very subtly, I was steering them in the direction of by bringing people like Josie to talk to my teenagers or other experts in a way where um, we would really bring these topics to their attention because the young people I work with are the young people who will be designing and shaping the future. So they already are, many of them are developers. They develop in their bedrooms. They are freelancers. They do work on Upwork on many different sites. And, um, and it's really scary sometimes the kind of stuff they come up with when they are influenced by their families, by the values that, mm, you know, even, even in a developed society like UK, some of the stuff they come up with um, is probably not something I would want to mention, but even just now that JC was talking, I was literally taking photos and putting it on our WhatsApp group. I have a WhatsApp group with about 100 of them, and some of them were making comments, and it was really interesting to see how um, some of the girls even would say, well, does it really matter what voice you know, Alexa has? As long as she gives me the information that I want, or some would say, well, it really should be neutral. So the voice should be neutral so that, you know, it caters for men and women and everything. Um, and then somebody else brought up research on CNN, which apparently justifies, um, you know, the research behind why all, you know, most chatbots have got feminine voice because apparently they're more comforting, so it's easier to, to talk to. And then someone else said, well, doesn't that reinforce then the stereotypes? <laughs> so um, I was sort of reading and it was really interesting to see how this debate um, evolved. But, and on the other hand, there were some who I know, for instance, the background of some of the children, they come from very traditional families where it's okay, so why not? But I suppose the work I do is um, about empowering them, in, empowering them through technology to change the world they want to see around themselves. And um, the hope is that when they design technologies is that they can account for the ethics, for the biases, for everything else. So very recently I have founded Teens in AI um, and launched it in the UN in May 2018. And the reason why I did this is because there is so much that's happening in the space of AI. and. I wanted to make sure that young people who are already developing AI or are interested, um, their, you know, the, the, the way they develop technology is in a way where uh, they do take into account the biases uh, and potentially when they, when they develop technologies, they take into account racial differences, gender differences and everything else. So I don't know yet because it's still too early for me to see the results of my work, although it, it has been ongoing for almost four years, but I'm, hoping that all the people that I surround them with will have some influence on the outcomes in the future. So I just wanted to show you very briefly um, a boot camp that we did where Josie was actually part of, and this probably was one of the most interesting outcomes we've had. That was a five-day boot camp with boys and girls. I suppose for me the important thing is, again, when we design our products, I want to make sure there are boys and girls in the room from different ethnic backgrounds, from different sort of age groups. Um, and I'm moving away from creating experiences for just girls. And the reason why I do this is because I want boys to be part of those conversations uh, and understand why girls' voices and opinions also matter. Um, except the very latest one, that last weekend when I had 100 girls hacking <laughs> in San Francisco and London, but that was purely a passion project just because we were celebrating Ada Lovelace Day and I really wanted girls to, be, to feel empowered and to see the role models. But I'll show you what we've done. Uh, was it May, June, I think, which was really, really exciting. So I am going to find that button. The Teens in AI Bootcamp and Hackathon are successive events spanning over five days in which Acorn Aspirations teaches kids age 11 through 18 all about AI. 
During the first three days, kids learn about the possibilities of AI. I'm building a deep neural network, a genetic algorithm, and then I'm going to do some reinforcement learning from scratch to try and compare them. Doesn't this all sound kind of cool? We're going to be able to cure cancer pretty soon, right? AI ethics. A naive perspective is just taking all the data and just training on all of it. And why is this bad? Because it can have a bias. Reinforcement learning. Like the goal was to train agents to uh, learn how to take the best actions with this kind of like inbuilt reward uh, system. And much, much more. Uh, I learned a lot about how neural networks work and how machine learning works and that there are actually like different types of machine learning, which I didn't know before. Then, during the final two days, kids use their skills by designing and developing projects that use AI to reach UN global development goals like gender equality, sustainability, and mental health. Let's see what people have to say about it. It's not um, like other hacking phones I've attended where it's all about the code. I've never found something like this in London. They come to something like this, they see that it's exciting, it's so much fun, it's creative, and that they can do it too. It's amazing to see the level of dedication here. We want young people to be empowered to create the change they want to see in the world. I like it. I really like it. It's quite cool. It's like very like relaxed, very informal, but still quite educational and mm -hmm. have learned a lot. If you haven't like started to be into technology, you, you should really now because it's just a really interesting thing to learn about in the world today. So, um, so this is what I do, and um, and really the hope um, is uh, the mission behind this is to ensure that whatever they produce, whatever they produce in the future, uh, they take into account everything we've just been discussing. So um, it remains to be seen what will happen, uh, but I'm hoping that. Uh, all the experts that I'm surrounding teenagers with and all the mentors that come to the hackathons um, would be able to influence them in the way where they will be shaping the world which is less biased and more ethical and hopefully the kind of stuff that we'll be producing is in the space of socially, socially responsible AI. That is what I hope will happen, but we will see. Thank you. Hello everyone. Can everyone hear me clearly? Okay, why is everybody so silent? Like it's a Friday night, let's have a bit more excitement that we're free. And you know, thank you for all coming as well on a Friday night. Um, but yeah, I just, um, my topic today is really talking about the work that I explored during my time at CSM. So this is like exploring this during my master's um, thesis. Um, it looks, it touches on around algorithms, um, racial bias, and gender bias as well. Um, because of we've only got a short period of time, I'm just generally just gonna go really, like, just a really simple, go through it really fast and um, quickly go through it. But my title is Algorithms and the Life of Brisha Broaden. Um, so my name's Alex. Um, like, that's like a funny picture of me outside 10 Downing Street wearing shorts because I like to redefine the aesthetic of what a technologist should look like or how you should basically go up and down. So. That's like my thing of like <laughs> dreading my hair, piercings, everything like that. So I really love to do that. Um, part of an organization called Community, And a lot of our work is looking at emerging technologies and humans because we believe that, or we, we see technology as an extension of ourselves as human beings. And we think it's pretty important that we are sort of, when we are building these um, technological products and services, that we are really having the human at the core of everything we do. So, Normally in a lot of the workshops I do, I always have like a slide at the back where it's just like a number of applications that we use on a day to day. And I normally say, what's so special about this? Then I get people to go around, go away for like 10 minutes, talk about in themselves in a group in order to basically find out what's so special about these applications. And it was more about demystifying what AI is. But I think a lot of times it's always framed as this iRob um, iRobot Terminator type situation, but it's in majority of the applications we use on it every single day. Um, but I like this definition a lot because it's it's, it's an interesting definition in terms of um, what we think AI should do. You know, calling it the art of how to make computers do things at which um, humans are currently better at. And today I'm going to go through this talk and show that that's not really possible. Like what Josie said, you know, they're great at computational stuff, but not really great at human stuff. But this leads me to my story of Brisha. 
So this is um, a snapshot of a young lady called Bishop Rodin in Florida um, about four years ago. And she was 18 at the time. And so she was with her god sister. They saw a number of bikes. And they basically took the bikes and literally ran off with it. And then they got arrested for it. And Brish is a bit of a naughty one. She's had like a few, you know, what would I say, squaffles with the police previously. Um, she's been arrested a number of times. However, what was being used in this sort of, you know, for the judge who was basically like examining, okay, Brisha, she's been arrested for this bike. She's had a number of arrests prior to this. What should I do? Should I, you know, let her go scot free? Um, or should I essentially, you know, put her in um, juvenile? Um, and so this judge happened to have this nice, really cool software, which is, thank technically a risk assessment software, which is basically used to be able to tell you who's m apparently most likely to reoffend based on a number of statistics and a number of questions which have been asked. However, Brisha was seen as high risk, and Vernon, who was more of a seasoned criminal, was seen as low risk. And so, I don't know if any of you are pretty familiar with this before. This was like part of an investiga um, investigative journalism by ProPublica. Um, where they sort of investigated around racial bias in crime centers and um, environments. And so what they sort of unpacked and uncovered was that, you know, a number of people who had like a lower criminal record, like for example, Robert on my left-hand side, you had one petty theft compared to James. Robert was seen more as medium risk rather than James was seen as lower risk, you know. And that was really interesting for me because I was, Trying to, you know, go into CSM it is an art and design school, and I'm like the technologist trying to like find my way in life, and I'm like, okay, I need to write a thesis that's 15,000 words, and I want to talk about AI, and who's probably going to mark this? Probably ain't going to know anything I'm talking about, so I need to be well, like, really high def. So, looking at this, it was like, okay, crap, like. How do I sort of communicate where this data is coming from? How do I um, also present that? So this is essentially what the offenders got was a survey. They got this particular survey, which is like 137 questions about you know, their experiences and who they are. I've highlighted two, two things because they're like relatable to me. I grew up like five minutes away from here. Now it's trendy. Peckham's trendy now. Well, it wasn't trendy before. And like, if you ask me that question, how many of your friends or acquaintances have ever been arrested? I could put many. You know, how many of my friends have served time in jail or in prison? I could put most. How many of my friends are gang members? I could say most. But I'm a master's graduate. That doesn't make me a high risk offender. I work in technology. I build cool stuff every day. But I'm not a high risk offender. However, if I get in trouble, based on these particular questions, I most likely to be high risk, even though if I've never done any crime before. You know, it's interesting because this stat, this sort of software, doesn't really take race into consideration, but it does take things which can evidently show racial disparity based on just the questions it asks, you know. And even to put it in context, into the 1970s, um, race, nationality, and skin color was actually a cont um, contributed to sentencing in, in America until somebody uncovered and said, whoa, this is a bit um, a human rights issue. You know, if we look at the statistics, that's like a big number right behind me. I'm probably not going to say it because I'll probably butcher it right now. But a amount of them were sent to prison, and the majority of them were black. And that even led to, like, in 2014, the former um, attorney general also wrote a speech saying that risk assessment scores are biased. You know, this sort of went really big on media. Um, a lot of people in this AI ethics space decided to talk about this. This became a prominent case study. However, you had people who, you know, like I, I say tech beef and it's similar to rap beef. It's just that rap beef, Drake can send a diss track, Meek Mill will reply back. And tech beef, people hardly read the academic papers except for people like me because I need to get a grade at this time. So with this particular piece, this was like, ah, uh, you know, especially for me writing the thesis as well, it's like, can I base my thesis off like a newspaper article I read? That's not really... I don't think that's a smart move to do. So I had to find, you know, being like um, trying to explore things and explore the space. So this was like a group of PhD people who sort of investigated this sort of article or this, and they basically said, look, what's currently done here 
it's a piece of rubbish, it's, it's shit, it's this, it's that, because this wasn't done right, this wasn't done correctly, and we can't really truly know how fair the algorithm is because we don't have access to it. And that's what they basically um, closed off. This was um, a paper written by the company who developed the software, basically saying, yeah, we're so accurate, trust me, we're so good, we know what we're doing. You know, like they're sending their diss track back. However, in 2018, a group of people actually went to try out this, and they basically, basically rounded it off saying that that software does no difference compared to a normal person if you gave them that same risk assessment. Which basically means that we've been pitching, you know, that's one issue about the tech space, is that we overhype what we're building. We're like, yeah, this AI system can do this, this AI system, don't worry, judge, Judy, you don't have to stress no more. You know, we, we can find out anything you do. You know, however, we are still very much at the early stage. However, similar to like the polygram machine, like the lie detector, you know, in court cases, it's not really, um, you don't, um, except for Canada where you could use it in an investigation, most of this information isn't admissible in court. And I think at this current stage, like where Josie said, we're building baby robots, we're building, we're still at the early stages. I personally don't think it's ready to be in the court environment. So I, oops, oops. Okay, technology, okay, cool. So at the time I was looking at guidelines, like if, I don't know, working with Josie at Methods and I, the criminal justice system says to Methods over here, like, oh yeah, we wanna, we wanna import, we've seen this software in the States, we're really excited about it, we feel like we need it, there's loads of hype right now, issues in the news. We think this will help us in detecting um, offenders, especially people from South London, Peckham. You know, so one of the things I put down in the guidelines is that it is software which is made by a company. We don't have access to implicit information about how the algorithm works. For a government's body, that is a big problematic thing because how can we track the transparency? How can we understand how the risk factors or the scores are calculated, you know? Also as well, the risk assessment scores are based on group data, which can designate people as high risk offenders, but not high risk individuals. And if you think of it, it's similar to like insurance. Like me growing up in Peckham, I know that my car insurance is ridiculous. It was like five grand. I've been trying to wait to 25 before I can cheat the system to reduce it. That's exactly true because of where I grew up and the group data shows that there's a high um, rate of crime. Also making it clear that this shouldn't be used in a sentencing environment, that it should be used as an assistive tool. And also looking at how the software also measures um, defendants and the, um, offenders to a natural sample rather to a local sample. So what happens if that population size expands is very important for the software to be updated to match that. <coughs> so in my work, because I spent a lot of time looking at US data, I was very interested in how we could sort of explore this from a UK perspective. However, I'm a technologist. I really don't know bias or systems of oppression or power really well. However, I happen to find an organization called Fearless Futures, um, run by um, Hannah and Sarah, who were very open to me to like, let's work together on a workshop where I would be the technologist, you'd be the people who are experts in bias and systems of power. And why don't we merge our two disciplines together? Let's reach out to all the different big tech companies in the country who are based there and they got their teams working on AI. Let's also looking at the work that um, around speculative fiction and speculative narratives, how do we also sort of explore um, those topics? And so this is like just a group of people behind us and we were playing like a number of games around bias, doing a lot of ca um, case studies, doing a lot of systematic stuff, having those uncomfortable conversations because talking about race, talking about bias, it's still very much an uncomfortable thing for loads of people. You know, I know me as a black person, a lot of people are still scared to call me black. And I'm like, yeah, just call me black, it's calm. But until we have that, that first step, you know, how are we really being able to address these important decisions? When people might say, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me, it doesn't affect anyone in my family. But this is important things that we should be discussing and reflecting on as we build um, AI um, technologies. So this is some of the lessons that we had, which was that, AI really isn't solving anything. It's just making bad human decisions for us faster. Um, fairness is subjective. Maths can't, can't really do that. Like, fairness is a human aspect. So if we're trying to build AI tools that are apparently fair, you're having a laugh. Um, accountability, algorithms on AI is complicated. 
like I've seen papers where people said we need to build accountable algorithms. I'm like, okay, how do we make mass calculations accountable? Isn't it more the people who are building the software? We're still in this blurry, messy space in terms of unpacking that. We've also got to fix the data. Like if I go back to one of my slides, it was looking at historical data shaped the way how crime sentencing is done. And that's a pretty important thing for us to identify in order for us to look at the training data and how can we sort of limit the impact of bias in, in, in what we do. Um, more conversations on bias is needed. We still need to create conversations. I think what the Institute is doing right now about focusing on technology and social and bringing these two worlds together is super important. And that's really amazing because we need more conversations on that. We need more conversations, more disciplinary teams. We need to explore these areas really well. And we also need a diverse team, which will be able to address insensitive and underinformed training of algorithms um, by AI. You know, and bringing it back to Brescia, you know, we are putting these things in our social systems. And someone like her, I don't condone what she did by st stealing the bike, but I still think she should be given a fair trial. And not just us just leaving it to machines and making decisions off that. You know, there's a quote that I would like to leave with, and it's by Philip um, Alston, who recently um, did a report for the UN about poverty, about human rights, and also around AI as well. And the quote says, it's extremely important for an audience interested in AI to recognize that when we take a social welfare system and put on top of it ways to make it more efficient, what we are doing is doubling down on injustices. And so I leave here saying that it isn't AI that's biased, it's us. And it's very important for us to look within and in order to be able to build products and services. That gives us the agency, that empowers us, and not puts us on the fringes of society and um, we feel violated. Um, as I'm an academic, I've got references behind me, but you can't really see them. But if you want the presentation, I can send it to you. But, um, and also I built this simple like cheat sheet tool online, just if you want to know buzzwords that are used a lot of time regarding AI. It's in 120 characters. It just explains stuff in really simple terms. And you can go in and speak, with, share it with other people. Um, thank you very much. Um, that was just such a brilliant way to think about the topic from lots of different perspectives. I had already uh, written a sheet of A4 of questions, and now I've got a pad full of questions as well, because it was so um, interesting what you said. Um, we'll definitely leave time for um, questions from you, because I'm sure everyone's got things that they would like to ask. But um, I, did, I did want to just pick up on something that you, you touched on right at the end, um, Alex, which was about it's not the technology that's biased, it's us. And I, I, I'd just really love to know from all of you what sort of, not, not percentage, but like how much do you think that the problem needs to be tackled in society before we even get to technology? You know, and I'm thinking specifically about the idea of people, you know, abusing their Alexa in their home. It's not a technological problem. So do you, how do you balance the need to tackle it in a sort of social context and then in a technological context. I've definitely got a view, but does anyone want to start? Go ahead. All right. Um, so I think I think they need to be intertwined. I think that's the best way forward. Um, if we start bringing in, you know, social justice activists, academics, philosophers, social scientists into the conversations with the people building the technology, these concerns can be woven in as we go. And if we maintain that as a practice, then hopefully that those complementary things can work together so we can take the best from the minds who are looking at these social issues and the best from the minds who are creating this pretty amazing technological innovation. Um, I think that's possibly going to be, that's my answer, yeah. For me, it's the, the values, the values in the families, the values in the societies. I expect different technological outcomes from a society here in England to what the work we'll be doing in Shanghai, for instance, to the work we'll, we were doing last weekend in San Francisco. And it's the values of those societies um, that really affect uh, the children we work with or the people that we work with that also then affect the algorithm. It's all about the values 
and those are really centered within the societies and families. So <coughs> there are some uh, boys and girls that are brought up in very traditional settings and the way they develop for them, it's okay to have an Alexa with a voice, uh, which is female voice. And others, so there is still an interesting, very hot debate happening in that WhatsApp oh, group. Yeah. They still are arguing because I literally have screenshot shot every single slide <laughs> that you've had, <laughs> sent it off. So, oh, Elena, we should have been here. And I probably, yeah, I should have actually brought them here because I think these are the kind of conversations they should be listening to more often. Um, yes, it's the society. And I think we do live, unfortunately, here in England. And I vowed that with Brexit I will exit as well, that we do live in a very broken and very troubled society. There is so much happening that needs to be fixed. Um, and, um, and it's just worrying uh, the, the way it actually does affect uh, technology that comes out with the people who are developing this, um, yeah, the troubled society. Um, I think it's a tough one, because I, like I say, technology, I see technology as an extension of ourself from when, you know, from the print and press, from writing, all the way to computer technology. And humanity is not nice. We, it's the honest truth. And, but it's important for us to identify, look, humanity is not nice. But if we're going to introduce these, you know, artificial, I don't know, beings, I don't know, algorithms, whatever you want to call it, into the world, then it's very important for us to identify our shortcomings, our flaws, and how we can really sort of like for example we talk about the data you know how do we uh, how do we have that honest conversation that our data has always been biased if you look at mm. my slide where it's like 137 questions that would identify me as a high-risk offender just because of where i grew up which mm. wasn't even like i chose that that's like a postcode lottery you know it's not by i, I was born into it but doesn't mean that i'm high risk mm. and if we don't even like have an honest conversation about that then it's a bit, you know, um, whatever, you know, we've, if you think of it, it's we, the, how does these, how does algorithms work? We've, how does all of, how do we make something intelligent? We feed it. And it's just like a child, you know, if you feel, you feel a child, you know, bad things, a child sees this is right. And if you don't, you know, how do you sort of like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to explain this in a non-technical way, but how do you sort of yeah. provide that environment where it can, also understand the bad and the good, but also right. be able to do the right thing always is pretty important. And I think even right can even be biased as well. But I think it's still having a conversation that's never going to be ending, but mm -hmm. it starts off with stuff like this. And I'm really happy that UOL is exploring this area because I think it's needed. And I'm tired of looking at US data, so we need some <laughs> UK data to help us out as well. So yeah. But also, uh, because my background is international, so I'm looking at uh, some case studies in, in China. For instance, China wants to be lead leader in AI in 2030. And obviously, a lot of stuff will come out of China because of the amount of data sets they have. But the question is, what kind of data sets data set is it? How was it collected? How representative was it? And, and if we look into further afield in African countries, which is also run by China, by the way, the, the entire continent, again, uh, the kind of data sets they have, who is it collected by? Um, some would say, okay, it's collected by the UN or international organizations there, but even the work of international organizations is also very biased, and there are certain specific reasons and agendas that they also have. So it's all down to the kind of data sets we have. A lot of it would be down to the people who collect the data, who also have specific values and are looking for specific things. Yeah. And it's also that the, the, the data collection has historically been done by large bodies, yeah. governments. And so they've set the classification. And so yeah, if you're a trans person, if you're a black trans person, you probably don't exist in most yeah. of the data sets unless incidentally. No one's thought about you and, and thought about how best to, to capture you in a way that is compassionate. Um, and so I think there's exactly building on what you've said, like the history of the data set is so important. And I think what's interesting with the sentencing um, software is it's almost like they forgot there was a broader justice system. Like, it's like we already know that people, you know, should be treated fairly, you know, it's like innocent until proven guilty kind of things. There are all these, these great principles um, and kind of, I think, solid values you could have built into that system to help balance up the bias in the data set that they were using. So it's, this is something that the academic Joanna Bryson says a lot. We already have mm -hmm. all these tools to deal with these issues in a non-technological way. Why do we all, all of a sudden forget about them when we start building technology? I also have a question around um, just the idea of standards. 
you know, you've been building some kind of framework for testing, could you ever say that you were building something feminist? And Alex, you talked about piecing together a kind of um, set of standards as well. And I wonder if you <coughs> believe, given that these types of technologies are emerging in so many different contexts and the data sets are different and, you know, you've got different challenges to face depending on who and where you are, are you hoping that some kind of global standards or universal standards would emerge or do you think they need to be like so localized or how do you see that? So I'm actually part of the IEEE, I think it's IEEE. Mm. Yeah, IEEE um, group. Um, we're looking at bias and algorithms and we're trying to like create this framework that looks at like different aspects of how bias and algorithms may come apart, you know, even though I'm working on this and like dedicating a lot of my time, the question is, is would people actually follow it? Like that's kind of like the truth. You know, if you think of technology has always been framed as innovative and we think that rules and boundaries stop us from being innovative. So we, if we look at technology, we break the rules, government chases us and then policy tries to build policy around it. You know, I think GDPR is a really interesting Sorry. example of a standard, but that was that's been implemented at a high level with, you know, if you violate it, there are some high financial, you know, things. So the question is, we can develop these frameworks, but how is it enforced? How is it regulated? How do we measure it? If, for example, my, in my case study where North Point, the company who developed the software, don't want to open source, they don't want to make me give it to an external researcher to sort of examine how they sort of calculate risk assessments and stuff. <coughs> and you're sending that to, you know, a, to a government to a justice board system, how, how, do we, how do we enforce that if we can't have access to it or if we can't regulate it? So there's always that conversation as well, is that we can develop all of these tools, but if we don't enforce or regulate, then it's a bit problematic. You know? I agree, um, and I think Cambridge Analytica case, um, he is really um, um, a, a great case study, an example of how um, any standards probably would be violated by big companies like Facebook, like Amazon, like Google, so try and enforce <laughs> regulations on them and they'll probably just, you know, show your finger and say, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, and um, I'm also part of the, um, the another IEEE group, so they've, they've asked me to develop um, a kind of framework that could be taught to children through hackathons and through, you know, classroom scenarios because I think they've realised that the, import the importance of ethics and AI in education, which is great to hear. Uh, but still, the question then remains, you know, how do we make sure that it's actually, um, people do abide by those rules? Um, and how would it be enforced when they really do violate those? Um, and um, with regards to whether we could create something global, I personally don't believe in that because the UN has failed many times and it will. And, um, and I can't imagine myself you know, having a global body that will really um, enforce anything on the likes of China <laughs> or Russia or anything right. like that. And particularly China, who is really has got this you know, ambitions to become the global lead, um, they probably will say, okay, you've got your ethics standards, we're going to have ours. And their standards might not be exactly aligned with the EU standards, for instance, yeah, yeah. or um, American standards. And then if America is still governed by the likes of Trump, <laughs> you know, um, what kind of standards and would we expect to come out when it comes to ethics and such? So, yeah, global standards. Um, there will probably be attempts to do this, but whether they will work, I, I very much doubt, because um, just as the UN hasn't quite worked in ways we anticipated or expected and have failed on many occasions in the same way I suspect there will be many trials and errors. Let us just hope that they won't be fatal. Mm. So. Yeah, and I think it's it's so complicated because it's from the minute detail to how teams work when they build the stuff to the bigger scale of regulation, global standards, those kinds of things. And it's and because it's being deployed everywhere and is going to impact all of society, it's you've really got to be working at all these different points. And so I think it's coming up with ways to best equip each layer to by default yeah. do better things, um, I think. And that's, yeah, that's, when someone figures that out, that'll be really great, yeah. <laughs> I've got loads more, but I, d I don't want to um, take time away from audience questions, so it, there we go. 
Do we need, do we need the microphone? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, I thought everything was really interesting. I had an opportunity to go to the Silicon Valley last year and visit a few of those big tech companies. And, um, and I visited NVIDIA, which is a huge AI um, company. And they took us through a tour, and it was really interesting. And in the end, there was a Q&A session. And we asked them, so when you build this technology, do you, because they were really proud of you know helping doctors in America build all kinds of crazy tools to um, to help them operate on people and then we asked them do you think about what what the n next step is and do you do you ever think of who you're selling your products to and there was an they kind of avoided the question and it was it was always a bit like oh but that's not it's not our job to think of what the people are going to do with our technology. And to go back to what you were saying before, humanity is not nice. And like you were talking about laws as well. And we've already thought about these things. Like there are laws to protect, to make sure that we don't mess up too much. And I was just wondering, have you tried and like get in touch with companies like that? This one is huge, but like maybe companies like that and kind of, or are there think tanks that exist to kind of try and build some kind of ethics committee <coughs> or like, I don't know, like a bill of rights to protect the consumers or, yeah, I was just, I was just wondering to go back to how do we, how do we make it happen? How do we make it happen? Because we're, we're thinking all these great things and we've got all these great tools and education is one of the things that's really important, but what about what's there right now and what's happening and, I don't know if that makes sense. It's a, good, it's a great question you asked. Um, in my thesis, um, I touched on it about internal culture, because that looks like there isn't an internal culture to be able to identify, um, have the user or human in mind in terms of what we're building for. There is a drive in the tech sector of build AI. Ooh, look at us, uh, fancy AI, give it a feminine name, raise billions of pounds or whatever, sell it to Facebook, whatever, and we're rich and that. But there isn't the emphasis of like that internal culture of are you putting a human at the center of your design and development process? Um, have you thought about the potential interactions? Have you thought about the positive interactions and the negative interactions? Even using user uh, using personas and user research, a lot of the times mm -hmm. we just think about good personas and we never think about like even a negative persona who might interact with our products and services. So even if we did create this global ethics committee, Depending on that internal culture of the organization, if they don't have ethics at the core of what they want to build, or if they don't have the human at the core of what they want to build in terms of their frameworks, in terms of like how they do stuff, we could, we'd probably be wasting our time. Just like literally creating, spending, sweating, blood, sweat, and tears, and it never gets um, taken on by the organization. So it's very much an internal thing that has to be ethics has to be at the core. A human-centered machine learning framework has to be at the core of how they implement and how they develop stuff. Um, and that's like pretty important. That's my answer on it. Yeah, and I think where <coughs> this space has moved so incredibly quickly. And so the so previously a lot of kind of innovation or new research and development would come out of very structured, ethically safeguarded spaces like universities or government. And then what would happen is that innovation would trickle into business and business would then deploy it. Now that is happening in AI, that's happening in the business and they don't have those ethical frameworks, the governance, those kinds of things. So a lot of companies are now setting up, you know, ethics boards and things like that. Um, but I think thinking about things that are existing in the world, because I'm a government nerd, um, I think government's got a really interesting opportunity available to it. So it has the, in the UK, they've got the government um, digital service and they have human centered design principles and gatekeeping approach to building digital services for citizens. So if you want to put something on, if you're a you know, Department of Work and Pensions and you want to put an aspect of your service online, you need to prove to GDS that you've done it in a way that's user-centered, you've done your user research, you've got your accessibility requirements, it can be accessed in Welsh, all these kinds of things, and only then will you get the tick, tick of approval to deploy that in the real world. So through that process, 
what government can do when it starts using AI, if it adheres to that process, it will build AI that is human-centred, that is accessibility friendly, all these kinds of things. And it can start to role model back to business what really good, effective design looks like. Because I don't think it's just about being ethical. I think taking these ethical concerns into, into account when you build stuff, having diverse teams that help you tackle these issues, you get to build more interesting things. You get more innovative things. You see things you wouldn't have thought of before. And that is awesome. So I think, strangely, if, if government thinks about it in this way, they could potentially become very, very innovative in the tech space for the first time in its entire existence. So that's me living with lots and lots of optimism. But yeah, I think that's one effective tool that you know we could look for. Jeez. And there are certain bodies you probably want to keep an eye on. It's IEEE. Um, you could definitely look them up and uh, keep an eye on their work in, in the field of ethics. Uh, there is Partnerships on AI based in Silicon Valley. So um, it's run by Terry Leons, very, very young um, lady who worked under Obama. So, it's, so she's doing some phenomenal work bringing a lot of corporates together. Um, here in the UK we have AI Council, chaired by Tabitha Goldstop. Uh, Cognition X, uh, definitely uh, keep an eye on what's happening there. Um, there is an annual COGX conference where we often meet um, and on panels as well. Um, I think we were, they, all, we were all speaking were we? at that, weren't we? Yeah. In different, probably different times, but yeah. yeah. On the, so when I, I was with teenagers as well. Um, and uh, there is also AI um, Institute of Ethics run by Alejandro Sosedo. Oh, uh, yeah. Institute for Ethical Machine Learning, something like that. So look, look him up. Um, so he's really, really active in that space. Uh, there are various bodies and think tanks. Um, even if you just put it um, into Google, you know, Institute for Ethical ML or AI Ethics Think Tank, it will probably come up. It's a very, very hot topic at the moment. Mm. Um, and every, whether you're in Silicon Valley or in the UK, it's discussed a lot. Um, so I've just returned from San Francisco a couple of days ago. So there we worked with Brighterian, which is led by one very ethical person, um, uh, Akli Ajouta, who, I, I mean, I really enjoyed interacting with, with that company. And I still go back to the values of the people who found companies or who are at the heart of the companies. So if the values are aligned with you know, views that we've expressed in here, then definitely the company will take into consideration all, you know, forms of ethics. And, uh, I mean, the reason why they've supported our initiatives is because they really want to um, to instill the, the ethics and the AI as it should be in the young generation. And, and so it really also depends on who leads those companies and what kind of values they personally hold. Uh, but in general, there are lots of think tanks and lots of work happening in that space. Yeah. I mean, I take that question also as a question of whose responsibility is this? Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think we can ignore the sort of corporate monopoly situation because the, you know, GAF is so <coughs> huge and so powerful and big tech has encroached into the area of, like, public services that mm. it just wasn't responsible for before it's you know it takes it sort of does politics so you you have to kind of counterbalance all of the different um areas like you know technology government and us as well you know i don't think we should overlook our own responsibility mm -hmm. as users of these technologies to kind of like vote with how we engage so i i guess it has to be like a multi-stakeholder yeah. kind of responsibility yeah sure. yeah I mean, I, this is not a very good sign of resistance, but so I use Messenger because a lot of my friends back in Australia and I turn off all the notifications because, you know, otherwise, you know, it just stresses me out. My phone's needing my attention all the time. And, and it's just so interesting how these companies are used to just invading your privacy, always being at the forefront of your mind. And I turn off the notifications and Messenger just can't handle it. Like every time I open it, there's a little thing being like, you're missing other stuff because you don't have your notifications. And I'm like, well, I'm obviously not because I'm reading this. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, they design by default to capture your attention and to hold it and make money from you. So, if, you know, if you're not paying for the service, you're the product. Um, and so there is a bit of voting with our thumbs in terms of how we engage this technology and what we permit these big companies um, to sort of, I guess, 
mine from us, but also how much we let them into our lives, which is hard. It's not easy. Like I'm always going to use Messenger, let's be real. Um, so so it is not, you know, a choice made in kind of an equal set of situations, but when you do have a choice, um, exercise that choice, I think. Hi, I'm um, a Luddite. So I shouldn't be here, but I am here. Um, <laughs> Woman with an opinion, of course I should be here. <laughs> so I'm a painter of fine art, but one of the things I'm quite interested in is the issue around resilience. And I wonder how AI could be used, formed, or something that gives those groups in society that don't have power, that don't have anything, or whatever they had has been taken away from them, some sort of bit of resilience that they can grow. So I, I understand all the issues you're raising and they're really important, but I think AI is here to stay and grow and get bigger and bigger. And I just think that if it's got that amount of power and impetus, how can we grab some of it for good yeah. for people that don't have much? You know, and I just think that I think about older women, I think about people around disabilities, I think about First Nation people. There's loads of stuff where mm. it would be good to grab some of it and give some other people some power. I don't know if that makes sense. No, yeah. absolutely. And I think there's, so one of the ways that chatbots, for example, can be very powerful is that they can help democratise access to services that people otherwise wouldn't be able to access. So there's, for example, like a lot of um, cognitive behaviour therapy bots that are being developed. So if you wanted to go and see a therapist for something like anxiety, which affects so many people, you can't always afford to go to a session that costs you £200. So these bots are usually a pretty good kind of gap filler in that space and does not cost you £200. Um, and, and while you know, your Amazons, your Apples, they're behemoth com companies that just want to make all their money out of you, they still do make available a lot of their technology. So for example, Amazon Lex, um, chatbot, um, natural language processing system that they have, imagine if we could use that to save languages that were dying um, from First Peoples. Like that, so that's there and there's nothing stopping us from being able to do that and Amazon would not stop you from doing that. So it is there, um, which is I think strange because you know on the one hand you're like ah, Amazon but then on the other you're like that's a great tool I really want to use that it could have such an impact so it's definitely the opportunity to be creative about how you use these things I'm sure Alex I'm a very strong believer in technology as an enabler so right now uh, there are so many opportunities to get involved in, in technology you don't have to be able to code to do this even just be part of those conversations <laughs> so if there are marginalized societies that want to develop AI to want to solve problems through AI or other forms of technologies, the opportunities are there for you. Um, so AI for good is a very hot hashtag on Twitter and Instagram, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure. And uh, there is a lot that's happening in AI for good space. Um, I mean, I can just give you a very brief example of Sage uh, Foundation has developed a, um, an app called Rainbow with AI capital AIs, um, and I believe that it's something they developed for women suffering domestic violence in African countries, for instance. So um, there, there are opportunities out there for every group that feels marginalized to explore whether technologies could help them solve problems. And probably this is the reason why I'm doing my work, because I work with a lot of kids from underprivileged backgrounds. Um, and it's an opportunity for them to get involved. And very often they don't just come get involved by themselves, they bring their family members. And because they themselves experience some form of um, you know, deprivation or some other stuff that they're really passionate about and they're affected by. So we have a girl who is dyslexic who would be developing a game that detects dyslexia <coughs> in primary schools, for instance. So it's about bringing different people who have got different um, passions or problems that they're passionate about solving, um, bringing them together in the style of hackathons, which is what I run with teenagers, um, and really getting those problems out there as challenges and seeing how we can solve these problems using technology. And it's all about agency and empowering people. So there are many opportunities to get involved, and, um, yeah, and I hope. Um, I think um, these, uh, Josie and Elena have asked, um, answered the questions. I think. Um, with technology, there is so much positive stuff. I think the reason why we're probably focusing on this side is so that 
those things can even be more positive. Because if we don't have those conversations, then we can just get blinded by the positivity that technology gives and not really focus on those areas. And I think that's why the design in the Feminist Alexa um, project is really cool, because one of the emphasis is that we're looking at how do you des um, develop sort of um, personal intelligent assistants that promote, I'm going to butcher this, so you're going to have to say this for me, Charlotte, because the, advance the two points, yeah, that advances the... The advance equalities for women or other marginalised groups. Ma marginalised groups, and that's like a key big thing of this project is really having that at the core and getting people to think about these marginalised groups and think, you know, and how can we use, you know, AI, how can we use this technology to empower them, to give them agency, because that's like the key importance of, I, I think for me that's the essence of technology, to be honest, is they give us, to enable us to have that agency, enable us to do these things, but I think we should do it right. So I think these two have answered the question really well, um, <coughs> and I don't want to ramble more, so. And yeah. I would just say there's no one that shouldn't be here because they think they're a Luddite. Like, it, this it really is for everyone, and it's such a challenge to make it, you know, <coughs> I feel like we should always say, like, if you think this isn't for you because of X, Y, or Z, think again, because, mm. you know. I'm a massive Luddite. Yeah, I break things that are technological all the time. Um, but I also have a kind of a deliberate Luddite-ness. So I'll walk into a project and be like, oh, so are you technological? And I'm like, no, but I have strong <laughs> opinions, so I hope you're right. ready for that. I um, don't even know that word. What is it? Luddite? So, so Luddite is um, it's used to talk about people who are, don't get involved in technology or aren't comfortable using technology. Okay. Sorry, English is not my first language, so I didn't even know what you were talking about, but okay. When I first heard it, I had to Google it. I was like, oh, I see. what is this thing? <laughs> There's a question. Oh, sorry, somebody handed me the microphone. I don't normally need it, but I lost my voice. Sorry for that. Um, I um, wanted to ask a slightly thorny question. I've really enjoyed this discussion so much, and there's many different strands of this. Um, I was at a conference a few months ago in Cambridge, and in fact, Joanna Bryson was there, and also Margaret Bowden, the um, um, scientist and uh, an incredible thinker. And she made a comment that's haunting me in the context of this discussion. She said, there is no such thing as artificial <coughs> intelligence because we don't even know what human intelligence is. This raises a question for me, which I find really tricky. Um, we are, obviously we're not at a point now where we're talking about sentience on the other side of these technologies. We're talking about, you know, um, voice activated systems and robotics or whatever it is that replicate human behaviors, whether that's language or whether that's act actions of humans. Is some of the real fear that we have here that we need to take control before, and some of these scientists don't think there will be sentient machines, think that this is many, many, many years away, decades away, if anything. And, um, and so is part of this about this kind of existential fear and terror that um, these systems will take over if and when they do become sentient? Because right now, artificial intelligence is a misnomer as far as I understand. I just wanted to put that on the table because it's just haunting me, yeah. I agree with that. I feel like AI hasn't progressed in years. It's just more CPU resources. Mm -hmm. That's really what Very it is. It, however, if you look at the yeah. examples we talk about, I don't think we frame that existential fear. I think for me, I'm a skeptic of those sentience conversations, so I try to really stay away from that. Mm. So I try to use real world examples of how we yeah. are using automated reasoning, which is, you know, some sort of form intelligent in a way, not maybe, this is maybe, the question now leads back is why do we have this desire to create human-like systems? Mm, what's, what's this desire? Um, yeah. And why can't we just use it to be enablers in this particular type of way? That's, yeah. we, we can have a long conversation about that all night, but yeah. you know, but the key thing is that, I think for us, it's for me it was essentially using examples of what's right now and being important to demystify what AI can do and what it can't do. So with the project that talked about the AI cheat sheet, that was like a big thing for us. It was like, for example, when DeepMind um, launched their ethics and society unit, they sent a press package to The Guardian talking about it. And The Guardian put robots as part of it. And that type of stuff, where the media, film, you overhype these things. We have speakers who probably never worked with AI before go and speak about it and like say, oh my God, it's gonna be this really drastic thing. 
We have people who proclaim themselves as futurists and say loads of this, but don't actually work on the technology. And for me, that was like a key thing of demystifying what it can do and what it can't do. But if you go on Twitter now, we have like robotics that apparently can do parkour. And that's like, people see that and think, oh my God, we've, we're well ahead. So I think it's, there's so much conversations in the space. It's very hard how to filter what's really like, what should we pay attention to and what we shouldn't. And I think all of us here has sort of showed real world examples rather than that existential fear of like sentiments yeah. and um, because the reason i said that is because i think that that falling into the abyss of that existential fear stops us from, ha from having pragmatic conversations and opening up the black boxes of technology to the point where we feel empowered to take charge so i agree with you I can only um, add to that that um, I was part of an AI um, stakeholder summit in the EU and the, the conference was framed as human in command. And I think there was a good reason for that as well because um, I think um, most people I know of don't really believe in that fear of you know sentient technologies. I mean, intelligence itself has to be defined and yet to be defined. Um, and, um, and I do believe, I can't remember the name of this professor from Oxford that I met at, um, at the... <coughs> AI summit in Geneva, but he again questioned the the word intelligence, and he didn't really believe um, in the fact that technology will become smart enough to outsmart the intelligence or the non-intelligence of the humans. So, uh, so it's, it's it's an interesting issue to discuss. But um, still, I think what we are where we are right now is that we are powering that technologies, and it's always ha has to be a human in command. Um, I've got, I've oh, got, I'm wearing mine. Um, I think there's also a critic, uh, we also need to unpack where this like, oh my God, the only outcome when they get smart enough is that they're going to want to take over and take everything and kill us and all of stuff, which sounds a lot like colonialism and imperialism. And so who's actually controlling these narratives? Um, so I think there's something about interrogating why can we only see a bleak <coughs> future because we've had a bleak past, which we have. Um, and it is mainly why people controlling and building these technologies and making vast amounts of money out of it. So it's not surprising that, that, that only that viewpoint's being shared. Um, and there's... So has anyone seen the film Her? Yes. Oh, my God. Oh my God I love that film. It's so good. I wish my house looked like that film. Um, and what I... And I have lots of issues with the film. But what I thought was very interesting, which we don't often see in the representations of AI in these kind of you know, semi-futurist films, is that they represented the AI as sentient, but sentient in their own right and having their own experiences in their own right. And so this, um, just a spoiler, this AI system um, is like a Siri, had a woman's voice, obviously, white woman's voice. Um, and and it, it's because it was a computer software that had sentience, it was able to have simultaneously thousands and hundreds of conversations at once, hundreds of romantic relationships at once, composing new music with a um, committee of other intelligent systems. And it just, if you think of, and that is just like a beautiful network of creation and connection and creativity. And so, that is a future that I think is pretty amazing. And think about all the cool stuff we'd get to experience as a result of that versus Ex Machina, which was a film about lady robots <laughs> taking over the world because the guy who built her only built her to, you know, have sex with her. And there was lots of mutilation of the previous incarnations of that robot. And so, again, it was like a narrative controlled by white dudes and all they could see was this technology rising up and being better than them and ultimately discarding them. So it's, I just think there is a lot in terms of how we even just imagine our own futures, let alone when we plop robots in the middle of them. So I think we were running out of time. So we might be only able to take one more question. I think, I think you have your hands up for ages. The guy in the back. We have drinks in the bar afterwards though, so we can carry on. Hi, um, I think my question is in two parts. Um, the first one was, do you think that the reason most people use, um, most people create artificial intelligence systems, artificial intelligence systems to sort of mimic how humans work, minus the whole 
emotional or the, the conscience part of it is, is the reason why people start abusing AI because they feel what they can't do to actual humans, they can do to AI because, hey, it's just a human but can't emote for itself. So do you think if, as a solution, you just made it super unrealistic in a way that it helped you in your task, but not as a human, but as a separate operating system in itself, would help solve it? And the second thing being, um, I think earlier this year, during I.O. Google released their assistant, which could actually make phone calls as humans. Mm, yeah. And the issue I had with that was everyone lost their minds over how cool it was. But when you dig deep down, it's a fact that they have been recording everything that all of us have been saying to these systems. And that's what has been helping build the system. So what is your stance on the ethics involved in building a data set for these systems as well? Just a quick question then. Yeah, real quick. Um, so the first part, I think the, so the market research and the academic research that's led to um, this view that humans prefer interacting with human-like systems is actually pretty woolly and it's not really that reliable. And so, but it's somehow seeped in as our design convention um, and, and that's really frustrating. But um, I think there is, there are kind of two bits there. First of all, I think we should always be clear when you're talking to a robot. And there is really good academic evidence that when people know they're talking to a robot, they yes, they act differently, but they're often um, more likely to share information about themselves because they don't feel like they're being judged because they know it's just a robot. So that's a strength of celebrating a robotness. So for example, men find it more easy to disclose issues around depression and feelings of not having any you know, self-worth, they find it easier to talk to a robot about that than a human because the levels of shame and judgment are basically eliminated. So that's quite an interesting aspect, think of robots. And also, I think you can have both something that's designed and clearly articulated as a robot, but also expect a certain standard of behaviour from the human that is engaging with that robot. And so I think when Alexa says, um, you know, I'm not going to respond to all your sex, sexual harassment, thank you very much. Even though it's a robot, I think it's still okay for that service to expect that the human's not going to be acting towards it in that way. But I think they're kind of separate things and they've somehow been conflated. That's my um, Just touching on to Josie's thing, because I think Josie, or oh, one of Charlotte, or one of you two touched on this in your talk about the objectification of these devices, which reflects the objectification of women in real life, which is why I say humanity is bad, because all we've done is just just repeat the same actions we do in a day-to-day -to, -day to, to a feminine voice machine. You know, somebody thinks it's really cheeky to say to a woman, I want to have sex with you. Oh, Alexa, let me try it out as well. And don't understand the implications of their, their actions. Or, you know, so it is us really that is still like a very human, you know, response. And that is very, I don't want to say it's not, it's not natural, but it is what's currently happening. And so I think that's a key thing that we have to like highlight is the objectification of both robot and both, um, and both women as well. And yeah, that's what I just wanted to touch on, just remembering that part of that humanity is bad and <laughs> we are just reflecting our actions in the same way. Yeah. Mm. I think with the duplex example, that horrified me in so many ways. So um, I'm not sure if everyone's seen it, but basically it's uh, Google's voice assistant. I don't know if it's called anything other than Google. Lisa. Lisa. I thought it was Lisa. Oh, okay. Google oh, Google Assistant, assistant. Oh, who may also be known as... The example had a female name. <coughs> oh, okay. The, oh, the right. girl that was taking the hairdresser booking. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, creepy. Anyway, so, you know, the robot was designed to have little kind of quirks in its voice that made it make the other person think it was a human. So, for example, you know, I said, I'd like to, you know, book an appointment for my, you know, whoever it is I'm booking an appointment for. And the woman goes, OK, on Tuesday. And the robot goes, mm-hmm. And just these little small kind of voice things that were very, very human. And at no point did the robot say, I'm, I am actually a robot. Um, and so I think there's something around, you know, having respect for the person who's interacting with that robot 
they need to know that it's a robot. They need to know that that conversation is being listened to by Google. They need to know and then they can make a decision about how they want to interact, if they want to interact at all. Mm -hmm. And it's really weird when these tech companies present it as, oh, but we're removing friction from our users' lives. And I'm like, I mean, I don't want to call the hairdresser, so that's great service, but I don't want a robot to call the hairdresser and not tell the hairdresser that it's a robot because I respect the hairdresser and I think there's something really weird about that dynamic and not being able to really, yeah. But that Gflex demo people. was so, it, it did exactly crystallize what you're saying. It got everybody, everybody that was in the company was just cheering and patting themselves on the back and so excited that the voice was so realistic mm. and it had the ums mm. and the ahs. And, you know, they were just completely absorbed in that achievement. But, and then everybody, and then there was this kind of torrent of critique saying, you know, it was terrible that, the, that Lisa, I think it was Lisa, <coughs> didn't say, hey, I'm a robot. But then they act, then it raised a lot of awareness about that problem, and, and now mm. that you know it does declare itself to be a robot. And in fact, Josie and I were talking um, this afternoon about okay, for these workshops, we'll add in something where when people are designing a conversation, there has to be a consideration of how is this bot that you're designing going to declare itself to be a robot, and how will it kind of maintain the user's awareness of itself as a piece of technology. Because we know we've, we know how much people treat these things like just as proxies for people. It's impossible not to do it. So you have to kind of constantly keep reminding the person that, that what they really are talking to, even if it feels really real, it's not. So it's cool because you get to reverse engineer from the problems to a better design solution. Mm. I just think my only comment on the duplex thing is, how real is it? I don't know. I, I've programmed voice interfaces and put videos online of me talking, and people think it's so natural. But I know everything what Alexa's mm. about to say, because I programmed it to say that. So even me, I'm like a skeptic on right. how real it is, isn't it? But that's, yeah. Yeah, and it's like the technological advance inherent in that, if that is what's happened, is amazing. It's so amazing, but they just applied it really badly. Bad, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. It's not to say that there should be no technological innovation or that Google should never have you know, tried to build something like that. But it's saying when that intelligent system hits the real world, intelligent system hits the real world, we need to, we need to think about that, that interaction far more carefully than we currently do. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. It's been a really amazing conversation. Thank you again to all of our speakers. You've been amazing. <laughs>